Welcome to Dangerous Wisdom, a journey into mystery and a gateway to the mind of nature and the nature of mind. This is Dr. Nikos, your friendly neighborhood soul doctor, happy to be here with you so that together we can create a culture of wisdom, love, and beauty. Auspicious interbeing to you and yours, my friends, Coinos Hermes, and a deep bow to Sophia Wisdom. I have a delightful guest. I'm here with the People's Advocate, Danny Sheehan, who is a guy I didn't expect to meet and a guy I was really happy to meet. Under strange circumstances, he got me to read the Pope, the Pope, Pope Francis, not a philosopher I thought I would read. And yeah. it was just so good and so much fun to talk to Danny about it. And also, he's just such an interesting guy. Danny, can you tell us a little bit about you, you interesting fellow you? Well, sure. Uh... It, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a, a full scholarship to Harvard College uh, and got to study uh, international relations uh, under Henry Kissinger and uh, sociology under uh, David Reisman, you know, in the economics under John Kenneth Galbraith, all those kind of really big guys. Uh, and then uh, was the Rhodes Scholar nominee from Harvard College, uh, but uh, refused to get drafted. Uh, and so they they registered me as 1A. And so I didn't get to go take the roads and went to Harvard Law School, uh, became the founder, co-founder with Mark Green of the uh, Harvard Civil Rights Law Review. Uh, and then went out and practiced law for uh, a few years right away, uh, initiated the case to establish the right of journalists to protect their confidential uh, news sources uh, all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, ended up being legal counsel for The New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, to get those 47 volumes published. Uh, ended up uh, going to the law office of F. Lee Bailey, uh, where we did the Watergate burglary case. We represented uh, James McC McCord, who blew the whistle on Richard Nixon and the, the Watergate uh, burglars. Um, and then uh, I realized that uh, this uh, needed a little bit uh, higher consciousness to really figure out what was going on out in the legal world. Uh, ended up going back to have a long conversation with John Rawls, who was the head of the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University. Uh, and uh, he persuaded me to come back to Harvard to do a master's degree and, and a PhD uh, in comparative social ethics, trying to compare and contrast the worldviews of different people uh, that I was running into out in the real world. Uh, and from there, I got drafted to uh, become the general counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters in their national social ministry office, uh, their public policy office in Washington, D.C., uh, where I served for 10 years. Uh, and we did a bunch of cases there. We did the Karen Silkwood case that stopped the construction of all private nuclear power plants. We caught them smuggling 98 percent pure bomb grade plutonium to Israel for their nuclear weapons to share also with Iran under the Shah in South Africa under the Afrikaner regime. Uh, and I realized that uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a fairly serious problem we've got here. Uh, so we set up the Christic Institute uh, out of the Jesuit headquarters to, uh, to be a, a major public law firm uh, and public policy center so that we could represent all 54 of the major uh, religious denominations in the United States we went on to do a number of cases, including the Iran-Contra case. Uh, we caught them smuggling weapons to the Contras in violation of a ban by Congress, uh, the CIA. Um, we ended up doing lots of other cases. We did the case against the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party that gunned down uh, labor organizers down in North Carolina. We did the first-degree murder defense for the first elected black mayor uh, down in Mississippi. Uh, and uh, we, we did the Three Mile Island case to stop them from pumping all the radioactive water in the damaged core into the Susquehanna River. So we've done, we've done a lot of cases like that. But it, it, I also, uh, and it turns out, uh, was retained by uh, the, when I was at Jesuit headquarters, I was retained by the uh, Congressional Research Service to act as special counsel for an investigation that President Carter asked to have done. As soon as he was elected, he asked for the Congressional Research Service to investigate the issue of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence uh, and the UFO phenomenon. He had seen a UFO, not just a light in the sky dancing somewhere, but a really up close uh, UFO. And so as soon as he was elected, he 
called in the head of the Central Intelligence Agency and, and asked to be briefed up on the issue of the UFOs. And the, C, the head of the CIA at that time was George H.W. Bush, uh, who had been appointed by Gerald Ford to take over that spot after Richard Nixon resigned. And uh, uh, Bush refused to give him the information. And so President, President Carter then asked to have the Congressional Research Service dig in on this and, and brief him. I was contacted by Dr. Uh, Marsha Smith, who was the head of the Congressional Research uh, Services Science and Technology Division, uh, to serve as uh, general counsel to the uh, to the investigation. And in that context, I was given access to the classified portions of Project Blue Book, which was the uh, secret investigation by the United States Air Force uh, of the UFO phenomenon that went on from 1952 to 1967. And uh, when I saw the classified portions of it, I found photographs of a major crash retrieval program uh, of the uh, CIA and the Air Force in the JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command of the Pentagon, you know, uh, recovering uh, UFOs uh, and uh, discovered that they were trying to back engineer the technology from the UFOs to make a weapon system. Uh, I thought this was a serious problem. So I uh, started trying to figure out what to do to stop that. And I ended up being contacted by Dr. John Mack, who was the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, uh, who was dragged up in front of a faculty committee at Harvard for having written a book uh, about this issue. Uh, and I was later contacted by Dr. Stephen Greer uh, and asked to become general counsel for the Disclosure Project. Uh, we held a, a press conference at the National Press Club in 19, in 2001, uh, where we presented uh, two dozen government uh, employees and officials who testified under oath to members of uh, the congressional staffs uh, about this issue, and then took a number of these witnesses to meet with their congresspersons to share the information with them. Also, I later served as special counsel to the citizens public hearings on the UFO phenomenon where we had retired U.S. senators and Congress people uh, have testimony presented to them by 40 witnesses. Uh, and I was later uh, retained by Luis Elizondo, who was the uh, director of the top secret program inside the Pentagon uh, investigating UFOs. And he asked me to represent him uh, in going to the inspector general of the United States Defense Department to try to get protocols established to protect whistleblowers who were being retaliated against by the intelligence community and a some sort of deep state uh, element inside the Defense Department. It was hidden inside an unacknowledged special access program uh, in which they were trying to uh, intimidate and threaten anybody who tried to uh, maintain that UFOs were real uh, that they appeared to come from some extraterrestrial civilization, uh, and that this turned out to be the deepest secret, uh, buried even deeper than the secrets of the creation of the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project. And uh, so I've been uh, working diligently for some time to try to get that information turned over to the Congress, at least, our elected representatives, so they could know that it's real, uh, and then they could determine uh, how much of this to reveal to our public, to the American people. So in that context, I've met many people who have uh, direct firsthand knowledge uh, of the uh, the fact that we've had a program going, the United States has had a program going for decades, uh, recovering a UFO craft and attempting to back engineer them. Uh, they're in the process right now. Uh, and the reason that we're so intense about all this right now is we realize that they have made some kind of a breakthrough and they're attempting to use the propulsion system for the UFOs to create a, uh, a nuclear missile that can be launched in the United States and strike China or Russia within two minutes. And the time has come that we've got to, uh, to declare a sort of a state of emergency here, that we've got to rally the American public since we're the 5% of the people on the entire planet who have the capacity to stop this kind of a program uh, and to try to establish a treaty uh, among the United States and Russia and China and other uh, nations that have nuclear weapons to get them to agree not to use any of this technology uh, to make any kind of a weapon system. 
uh, and that has generated uh, the legislation that is getting set to be signed into law uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, ironically, uh, at the uh, winter solstice. <laughs> yeah, Just winter solstice 2023. For those of you yeah. who are listening at different time, that'll be the 21st yeah. of uh, December 2023. Yeah, and uh, so that's that's getting said to be signed into law, which for the first time, Congress has issued a command, uh, which will be supported by the President of the United States, uh, President Biden, uh, commanding that uh, all six of our U.S. military services all 18 of our U.S. intelligence agencies, all 32 of our Defense Department agencies, and all of the private uh, aerospace technology corporations who may have been put into possession of any of this UFO technology uh, from this secret element inside our government, uh, that uh, they have to turn over all of that to Congress so that Congress can uh, be informed about what the state of the program is uh, and how much of this should be revealed to the public and what steps they might take to try to reach out to establish a treaty uh, with the other nations of our planet to come to grips with this reality. Uh, rather than making weapons systems out of the technology, try to figure out what the protocols need to be pursuant to which we can all collectively establish direct uh, official communication uh, mm -hmm. with the extraterrestrial species uh, to determine what the nature of the uh, uh, any federation might be among the different star systems that surround us uh, and try to understand what their uh, mission is in coming and going from our planet. There's all kinds of information about uh, tens of thousands of people who've had direct interactions uh, with uh, one or more of these craft uh, and with individuals uh, from different species. Uh, I mean, it is, it is extraordinary and astounding as this all sounds. Uh, it turns out to be true. Uh, and uh, one of the things I'm trying to do from our background at the Jesuit headquarters is to work with the Catholic Church and the other major denominations in the planet, on our planet, to uh, adjust our human worldviews uh, mm -hmm. and our theories of uh, uh, the role of our human species in the universe so that we can integrate this larger reality uh, into our human worldviews so that we, in fact, don't uh, just abandon all hope that we might qualify, uh, even given some of the low consciousness activity that uh, our people all seem to be engaging in, right. uh, we might qualify uh, to participate in whatever this uh, intergalactic uh, federation might be uh, with some respect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from, from this civilization. Uh, so that's that's uh, what I've been doing. Whoa! I mean, okay, this is like a twist episode. For those of you who are wandering in and I start talking about the Pope and Laudato Si and you hear about a Harvard-trained lawyer argued major, major cases. And some of those things are in our consciousness because Kissinger, uh, for, for some people, um, almost celebrated that he passed recently because of uh, many complicated issues around his history. But then Ellsberg, people were sad that he, and that's connected with the Pentagon Papers. And so there are all these major people and major cases, uh, the Greensboro massacre you mentioned and the Silkwood case, which a lot of people probably don't know some of these cases, but but the Silkwood case was so interesting for reasons you were you were talking about this kind of um, unethical activities on the part of, of government, technology, corporations, this kind of convergence of issues. And then here we are, we're taking this almost crazy twist where Carter saw a UFO, really believed that he did, yes. and and then you had access to top secret information, saw photographs of wreckage site. So here we have a Harvard-trained lawyer who argued in front of the Supreme Court was saying, this stuff is real, it really is real, and now is a time where we have to think it through. And for me, see, as a philosopher, I, I actually, I'm, I might be one of the few philosophers, or at least I, there's no philosopher I've met who in their PhD dissertation uh, brought in the UFO literature, right. uh, or now the UAP literature. It was, it was kind of, uh, you know, still UFO literature whenever I wrote the dissertation. And I uh, read Whitley Strieber. You mentioned tens of thousands. Strieber m makes the case that he tracked he, all the letters that he received, and he tried to keep track of them. And it was like a quarter million when he gave up. And, yeah. you know, people who were saying, I have had experiences like this. His That's view right. philosophically is super nuanced because... Although he's open to the possibility that, yes, clearly there, there might be civilizations outside the earth. He also argues that consciousness is even more important than we might realize because just saying that that it's only 
extraterrestrial civilizations leaves out other kinds of experiences or other dimensions where it's not so simple. It's just somebody else has tech we don't have. There's something to do with consciousness. That's right. And um, most right. recently, and I hope to do an episode just on this, I, I, I was watching the movie Arrival and could not believe how sophisticated the discussion is. And you you brought up some of those issues that we're focused on, what the, what the movie focuses on, this confusion about weapon versus gift, and that our tendency is to think in terms of weapons and not in terms of communication, which is the core to the story, that the military has to go to a communications expert. That's okay, right. so all that is is here. I'm just introducing some of this, and let's get to this legislation. So there is this legislation. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What's, of course, it, a little nerve wracking that this might be the Congress we trust the least, with people in it who seem almost committed to the destruction of our ecologies and and to life on the planet, doing things that are not helpful. Yes. And but this is the Congress who if we're if we're hoping who passed this legislation. We're hoping is going to review this uh, information. But can you tell us about it? about it a little bit, just your your short take. I know you don't want to go into too much of the legislative detail, but what do we? What did we start with and what do we have? Well, what we started with is a 64-page bill uh, that was drafted by the staff of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and this was the UFO Controlled Disclosure Act. Uh, and this was calling upon, uh, it, it was going to command all of these uh, US military services, intelligence agencies, Defense Department agencies and aerospace industry uh, participants uh, in the secret program to turn over all of this information to the uh, Library of Congress, ironically enough, uh, to put into the uh, National Archives uh, and make it available for Congress so that the members of Congress, at least the intelligence committees, could really evaluate this and determine you know, what policies ought to be promulgated, uh, predicated upon this knowledge. Uh, so that that act got put together, a 64 page act that was to be inserted into the much larger annual National Defense Authorization Act, which is about 3,500 pages. So this was like a 64 page act that was going to be put in and what it what it called for from the Senate. Uh, and it was passed unanimously by the all the 17 member uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. All, every single Republican senator, every single Democratic senator, and then it passed the United States Senate, you know, by a 48 to 11. Uh, and, and so that uh, this was a, uh, a major, uh, a major bill that uh, got passed. Uh, it went to the, the House of Representatives and then the Republican head of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Republican head of the, Se the House Armed Services Committee joined together to try to block it. Uh, they maintained that this was an extraordinarily important secret. Nobody should know about this. Uh, this entailed uh, some kind of a, a ultimate secret weapon system that they were trying to work on uh, and that this was uh, to be banned. So we went toe to toe with these people for, for some time and they finally, what they did is they insisted that the there was a provision in the Senate bill that gave the right of the government under eminent domain to take back into our physical possession any and all craft that had been recovered, UFO craft, that may have been put into the hands of a number of the aerospace uh, technology industries like uh, Lockheed Martin uh, in this group called Radiance Technology uh, that had possession of some of this technology and were working on this secret project that was called Prompt Global Strike it was that was to try to create this uh, uh, two minute missile system, which is horrific. I mean, a it's huge, totally huge horrific. issue because, you know, again, the 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 doomsday clock is just as close as it's ever been to midnight. We oh, don't recognize that nuclear is still a threat, even accidentally. The, the sheer number of accidents that have almost destroyed the planet makes you believe that there's something reaching in and, and saving us. But but yes, this is hugely terrifying. So, so the so that that Senate bill was sent over to the House side to try to implement it, uh, and because of the opposition uh, from these two extreme right wing uh, Congress people, uh, I, not ironically, one of which uh, was uh, in the the head of the, this fellow uh, Mike Michael Turner, uh, who was the, the Republican head of the Senate the House Intelligence Committee. His congressional district is the 10th district of Ohio, 
uh, which is right where Wright Patterson Air Force Base is. Uh, and we all know from our years of these research that the crash that occurred at Roswell, the famous crash of the UFO at Roswell in July of 1947, the, the craft and the remains of the craft and the bodies of the UFO people were brought to Wright Patterson uh, Air Force Base, Wright Field at that time. Uh, but the bottom line is it's also the chief field office for uh, the location in the 10th Congressional District of Ohio is the, the chief field office for Radiance Technology, which is working on the secret program. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that the head of the, the Republican head of the, the House uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, Michael Rogers, comes from the 2nd Congressional District in Alabama, which is the home base of not only the, uh, the uh, Redstone rocket missile testing range, but also the headquarters, n national headquarters of Radiance Technology. Oh so these goodness. two guys, and it turns out that, that Rogers' uh, main funding uh, source for all of his campaigns is in fact Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that these two guys who have been basically bought off by the aerospace industry, uh, stuck their thumb in the eye of the Senate and, and uh, uh, recruited this new guy, Michael Johnson, who's the new acting speaker of the House, this newbie guy that's there, uh, uh, got him to support uh, stopping the bill. So there, we went all along through this huge negotiation process, uh, and we, we got out of the 64 pages of the original Senate bill, we got 24 pages uh, approved by the House. And so we've gotten a 24-page bill that has now been put into the National Defense Authorization Act and it's getting set to be signed into law on December 21st of 2023. Uh, and so that what this what this uh, new law uh, provides is it commands from Congress, and when the president signs it, a command from the president of the United States to these military services and intelligence agencies and aerospace uh, technology corporations, commands them to turn over all of this information uh, to the National Archives and therefore to the Congress, the intelligence committees. Okay, that's extraordinary. I mean, that's a, that's a bold step taken by the United States Congress and now a bold step that will have been taken by President Biden in mm -hmm. signing into law, commanding for the first time in 75 years that all of this information has to be handed over to Congress. So how much teeth do you think that's going to have? Because, it, it, you know, if this information is so deep, deep, deep secret and say we've got three cases of, of files and we say, well, we've got one case of files. Here you go. I mean, I, how how much can we trust this? This, this is the, 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 the amount that we can trust them is zero. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, when I was, I was legal counsel in the Iran-Contra case, that we succeeded in getting a, a, a command from Congress and the Boland Amendment. Uh, in, in March of 1984, commanding the intelligence community and the military not to provide any military equipment to the Contras. Uh, and yet they went right ahead and did it anyhow. Uh, we caught them uh, at our Romero Institute. Uh, we caught them doing that. We filed a major federal criminal racketeering act, civil lawsuit against them, dragged them into court, uh, and forced a major set of public hearings, uh, the Iran-Contra hearings that revealed what they were doing and got them to stop that. Uh, we're hoping that we aren't going to have to do something as dramatic as that here in this case, but to, to have just a bald-faced command come from Congress, even though it's, this one will be signed by the president. Yeah. Uh, the resolution, the Boland Amendment resolution, didn't have to be signed by the president back in 1984. This is being signed by, by Biden, who is the commander-in-chief of the military. Right. Uh, and he's ordering them to turn this over. Now, uh, the Senator Schumer, the majority leader in the United States Senate, uh, was the primary sponsor of this bill, which is quite important. Uh, and they got Mike Rounds, who is from the probably the most the reddest, most conservative state in the country, South Dakota, a Republican who co-sponsored the bill. Uh, we have we have both uh, Senator Gillibrand from New York, a, a very liberal United States senator. And we have Marco Rubio from Florida who's a very conservative Republican uh, senator, all of them co-sponsored this bill. And what uh, do you think explains that? I mean, so because uh, on the surface, we are so, there is more division and depth of division than we've had. That It's really polarized. 
Yes. And some of those people, like Marco Rubio, I think, really? And I and I wonder, is it because they sense that it's there's a general fascination with this? And so, you know, this is a good thing because people are interested in anything that makes the government cough up secrets or we uncover these sorts of corruptions, but they don't really think anything's going to happen because it would seem to me that the threat at a cultural level, it, in the ways that we might be forced to look at ourselves and think about transforming, would be very problematic for some of those people that you're mentioning, that they they might really, that this is not good for the image of Marco Rubio that I have in my head or the image of South Dakota conservatives that I have in my head. And, that, and I'm not trying to judge them. I'm just saying this might challenge our socioeconomic political structures in ways that some conservatives would seem to be really freaked out by. Why do it's, you think they would support it? Well, it's extraordinary, uh, ma mainly because they're completely offended by the fact that they've been read out of this program. Uh, you know, they're they're members of the United States Congress, after okay. all, uh, yeah. you know, and that they've been shut out. Uh, for example, uh, Gates uh, went, you know, went to one of the military bases. There was a UFO sighting at one of the military bases, and he went there as a member of Congress to try to find out what was going on, and they wouldn't even let him in. Okay. Uh, and he was totally <laughs> thinking about that. And so now we have meetings. We, I've been in the room in meetings with with uh, with Gates and AOC, Alexander uh -huh. Ocasio Cortez. They're probably two extreme uh, opponents in the United States House of Representatives, sitting in the same room, cooperating, right. uh, friendly with each other, right. uh, demanding that the Congress be briefed in on this. So because for those, because I have listeners outside the country, especially my high friends in England, Ireland, um, Africa. Yes. But so these are these, if you look up Google Gates and you're going to find this is a very right wing, some people yes. find him to be Absolutely. comically right wing. And AOC is uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Ocasio who's who's a very, very liberal. And so she, it would be yeah. really weird. It's like, yeah. you know, the strange. She is the leader. She is the leader of the Progressive Caucus, de facto. Yeah. yeah. You know, with 103 members of Congress is the largest caucus in the United States Congress. Uh, and she is the, the de facto leader of that. Uh, she might not like me saying that, but it's true. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and she's she's a, a very high level perspective candidate for the presidency in 2008 uh following this upcoming you know totally disruptive 2004 election that we're going to have here in the united states 24 24 and 28 right yeah, yeah i think it's 24 uh, yeah so this is <laughs> nice, this is 2024 it's going to be yeah. happening between trump and biden yeah. but the, the minute that that election is over whichever way it goes the 2028 campaign for the presidency to replace whoever wins is going to take start right there. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, she's the favorite uh, of, of all the progressive community to be the new president. Uh, and, uh, and so she's in, in Matt Gates is an extraordinarily right wing reactionary guy, uh, as you say, almost comedically. So, uh, and yet they get along totally on this, on this issue uh, as does Tim Burchette who is, you know, from Tennessee, this extraordinarily conservative uh, guy, you know, you go into his office and they don't, there's no New York Times there on the table. There's no Washington Post. What they have is the Epoch Times, which is this hardcore right wing propaganda rag, you know, on his table. Uh, and yet we get along totally famously with him on this, because as an institution, the Congress of the United States, which is, in fact, the functional government of the country, after all, the executive branch is charged with enforcing the laws, but Congress is the one that makes the policies. And so that they've been read out of this program. And so they are institutionally offended, uh, constitutionally offended at what's going on here. That uh, makes sense. That makes a lot more, of sense. More realistically, they're, they're, they're embarrassed uh, because they've known that they've been being read out of this program for like, the last 50 years, right. but now it's been publicly exposed. Now okay. that Colonel Grush has testified in front of a congressional committee on July 26th of this year, stating that we're in possession of a, an extraterrestrial non-human spacecraft and the bodies uh, of an extraterrestrial non-human species uh, that are piloting these uh, UFO craft. Uh, uh, and and that therefore, the Congress has been embarrassed yeah. by the fact that they now are publicly exposed to the, to the public of having been read out of this program 
Right. And so that they're now standing up on their hind legs collectively and demanding to be put into possession of this information. And they realize that they have to agree to show some of it to the public. Yeah. Now, th another major important provision over and above the command that the, this information be turned over to Congress uh, in the bill that's getting set to be signed into law uh, on the 21st of December. The second important uh, major uh, provision of this is that any of that information that came into the possession of the United States government more than 25 years ago, from anything before 1998, has to be publicly revealed uh, within 180 days. This is stunning. You it know, is stunning. All, all the people that are wringing our hands and moping around and jumping out of first story windows, you know, over over the fact that the the the, the 64 page bill didn't get get signed. You know, this this provision of the 24 page bill ordering them to publicly release uh, uh, anything within 180 days of the passage of this law, you know, that which is like six months. You know, we're looking at for six months from now, you know, uh, basically we're, we're talking about the the what the, the summer, uh, the summer solstice. Yeah. And we the would have answers solstice. about what actually happened in Roswell. In theory, yeah. it would just it's, be that you know, this Roswell, is available. Aztec, all of those all of those previous uh, activities that all took place basically before 2000 you know, has to be revealed unless the president himself intervenes and specifically requires that a particular piece of information be postponed from public revelation. But the bill requires that he issue some statement as to why he's concealing that particular piece of information. Now, and given the fact that Biden supported the 64-page bill <laughs> that was passed in the Senate, you know, that uh, we believe that he's going to exercise pretty restrictive uh, standards as to what he's going to try to keep concealed. Mm -hmm. Now, our job at the New Paradigm Institute uh, uh, is of, of our Romero Institute. It's a special project that we have, uh, has been designated by the Senate bill to be one of the agencies that was going to be nominating uh, people to be on a special board to review all of this information. Uh, and that part was taken out of the 64-page bill. But our institute, the New Paradigm Institute, is still in a position to be able to try to mobilize the American public and the citizenry to focus on putting pressure on Biden not to keep secret mm -hmm. uh, any of this information uh, that's more than 25 years old. Uh, that that's the normal release of public information that has to be revealed. We're not asking them to reveal the secrets of the nuclear bombs, you know, or anything. But, you know, the fact that there is a, a an unlawful, uncongressionally authorized uh, secret program going on with the CIA and covert operations people, along with some aerospace industries to make a weapon system out of this thing, that ought to be revealed to the public. In fact, I've already revealed it to the public, you know, and, and so that we, we need to mobilize now to stop that program from going forward. And at the same time, to reach out to Russia and China uh, and other nuclear uh, powers in, on the planet to enter into a treaty that prohibits the use of any of the UFO technology to be used in any kind of a weapon system and to make sure that that's enforced. Yeah. No, no, so so this is this is a an extraordinarily important moment, uh, you know, and and to be a little bit conscious about it, uh, it's it's easy for people to keep track of because it's being signed into law right at the at the winter winter uh, solstice, and the 180 days is going to expire right at the summer solstice. Right. So, you know, June 21st of this year, 2024, we should be having a huge. Uh, revelation uh -huh. uh, of the information that we've had possession of for 25 years or more, revealing the fact that the the there exists a, a highly intelligent, highly technologically developed, but distinctly non-human species uh, uh, out uh, in space, and that secondly they've been coming and going from our planet. Right. And it could be more than one, but it, it there is, it's one. just more. the existence. There's something. Yes. And it could. Yeah, it could that's be right. many. We don't know. Yeah. Right. So that's the issue. You know, yeah. I mean, how many how many UFOs have to be real <laughs> in order to yeah. have the issue made 
you know, th this is this is something that our human family is going to have to come to grips with. The Catholic Church now, uh, they, they have issued a, an official public statement saying that now the time has arrived for our human family to begin an important conversation about the profound philosophical and theological questions that are posed to our human family now by the upcoming discovery of life elsewhere in the universe. That's that is an huge statement that's been yeah. issued by the Vatican. Okay. Wow. Wow. So that we've got that. We've got the Congress now uh, getting set to take control of that information. We've got a president of the United States that has been supportive uh, of a program to have what they call a controlled disclosure campaign uh -huh. uh, taken by the American government. And so they're going to have to reach out to the other uh, major powers on the planet and establish some sort of a cooperative program pursuant to which we all decide how we're going to relate to this extraterrestrial civilization. We mm -hmm. need to find out much more about it. And I'm sure that the intelligence agencies have done research on this yeah. so that they know that there's there's at least a half a dozen uh, different species. You know, there's the small grays, there's the tall grays that they refer to them as. Uh, there's the the, rep, the reptilian people. And it's extremely important for people to understand the reptilian people. A lot of people have extraordinarily positive things to say about them. You know, uh, that uh, Barbara Lamb, for example, who's a major uh, respected person in the UFO community, has had a direct face-to-face -face encounter with one of the reptilian beings who was extremely loving, extremely positive, uh, uh, and, and, and was not frightening. Uh, you know, so the, the, this is this is like an extraordinary moment in the no, history. It's so extraordinary. I just, I, I really, just, as a philosopher, because here's the thing, I, I, I've always been much more connected to philosophy in the old vein, the, it, you know, the Socratic spirit, which doesn't really exist in the academy. I mean, you know that. Look, John yes, Rawls, I, I respect him, but still there's this, there's this drive that has been around for hundreds of years of professorial philosophizing. Right. I, and I, so I, there are a lot of things that we're talking about here that I think a lot of my my friends in the academy, but also people in the general public are, are there's there are two tracks to our minds almost when, when we hear this. One track is saying, eh, this is probably kooky. And then the other track is saying, but but really, is it, is it? You know, there's a part of us that hasn't fully accepted it. Why do you think, what prompted the Vatican of all, like a, a bastion of what we think of as conservative thinking to actually issue a pro proclamation where they're recognizing, in other words, they're saying, we accept that yes. this is real when a, a lot of us some part of us is saying yeah i'll believe it when the when the ship lands in my backyard but i'm just trying to get at how extraordinary it is that i can imagine some people listening or watching right now are thinking i don't know who this guy is but he's a little kooky right what do you think prompted the vatican how did that how did that happen that they got to that point of saying we we officially recognize this and recognize the theological demands that this and philosophical demands this makes on us Specifically, what happened is that uh, that uh, that Pope Benedict actually uh, asked a uh, a number of top level world scientists, uh, astrobiologists, astrophysicists, uh, astronomers, you know, uh, scientists of the, all across the spectrum, to come to uh, Castle Gandolfo, where the Papal Observatory is, uh, to have a briefing to brief the Vatican staff. Uh, about the discovery of more and more of these new exoplanets uh, and that they were discovering exoplanets uh, through the mounting of the Hubble telescope and more importantly, the James Webb telescope. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and we should and, say uh, for people that th this term exoplanets refers to habitable planets outside of the solar system, places where there, there could be life, just in, in case anybody's not familiar with that that's term. That's right. Uh, yeah. And what they said is, in, in light of the discovery of more and more of these new exoplanets, uh, it has now become clear that uh, much earlier than had been previously anticipated, <laughs> what the statement says, that we are going to discover life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, and therefore, the time has now arrived uh, for us to uh, undertake this, this discussion among the laity of the profound philosophical and theological uh, questions that are posed to our human family by the discovery of life elsewhere in the universe. Okay, now I, as a former general counsel of the Jesuit National Headquarters in their social ministry office, reached out to uh, to Jose Gabriel Funes, 
who was the director of the Pontifical Observatory uh, and flew to see him uh, within days of the statement. Uh, and he, sa he said to me, he said, look, Dan, uh, when we're talking about the discovery of life elsewhere, we're not talking about the discovery of some single cell life form under some frozen sea on some distant moon of right. some distant planet in a far off galaxy. We're talking about another highly intelligent and highly technologically developed, but distinctly non-human species right here in our Milky Way galaxy. And that's what he said to me. And so I knew that the time had arrived to try to start inspiring this set of discussions. Yeah. Uh, and so what we did is uh, at our Romero Institute, uh, which is the successor to our Christic Institute, uh, that, you know, that uh, George H.W. Bush yanked the 501c3 of the Christic Institute right. for prosecuting the, the Iran-Contra case against them. <laughs> he said that that was a political activity uh, and that uh, he yanked our 501c3, got the IRS. To, so we became the Romero Institute right away. Uh, and the New Paradigm Institute is a, a project, a wholly integrated auxiliary project of our Romero Institute. So that we set up the Romero Institute to help promulgate this set of conversations. Uh, yeah. And it was because of that that uh, that uh, Louis Elizondo uh, reached out to me to have me become his lawyer. Uh, he was the, as I mentioned, of the top secret program inside the Pentagon investigating the ufo phenomenon he had become totally frustrated over the fact that they were blocking him that this deep secret element inside the uh, the american government somewhere uh was blocking him from getting access to the information the the head of intelligence for the joint chiefs of staff uh in the military were, was unable to get briefed in presidents have been refused the information like jimmy carter you know, and he was totally frustrated. He concluded this was unconstitutional. <laughs> and so yeah. he decided to reach out to me because I had been the attorney for the Disclosure Project for 20 years. I was, in fact, the attorney for John Mack, uh, who had confronted Harvard on this issue. Uh, and so he reached out to me and asked me to represent him in our dialogue with the Inspector General of the United States Defense Department to get a set of principles set forth, a, a set of policies to protect whistleblowers so that they could come forward and tell Congress about what was going on. Uh, and so that's how I, I got drawn into the, the center of, of this dialogue uh, and the people that are crafting the bill that's gonna be passed by the Senate. Uh, so, so that's how we've come to be in this. And, but but my my approach to the whole thing comes out of my Jesuit uh, background at the at the headquarters in Washington D.C. So I view this entire thing as a spiritual issue mm -hmm. in its relationship to philosophy. The, you know the, the relationship between high philosophy having to come to grips with the issue of consciousness, the whole mind body di dialogue that goes on inside philosophy. And how that relates to the discovery in the field of quantum physics about the relationship, very importantly, the relationship between an exercise of human intention mm -hmm. and its effect upon collapsing the wave field, you mm -hmm. know, so that it, it actually manifests material reality. This yeah. is the stuff that you were, you were talking about, the more sophisticated stuff uh, that is being talked about uh, by, by uh, a number of people that this role of our human consciousness and its relationship to material reality uh, is the high stuff of philosophy, yeah. uh, and the high stuff of theology. And so that what we need to do now is we need to revisit all of the major disciplines uh, that are taught in the academy at the universities about what the impact is going to be on each of those fields uh, by the recognition uh, that our human family uh, is somewhere in the chain of, of consciousness, uh, but not at the apex, probably, uh, that there are civilizations that, you know, our, our uh, universe, uh, our universe is, uh, is approximately 13.5 uh, billion years old. You know, our planet is only 4.5 billion years old. Right. You know, so there are other there are other planets and other star systems that have existed, you know, more than 10 billion years longer than we basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that there can be civilizations that 
have risen and fallen and risen again to the point of that they may be two, three billion years in advance of us, not just in technology, but in right. addressing these profound philosophical questions, right. theological questions that arise uh, in any conscious being. Right. I mean, these that, could be civilizations that, that are composed of, of a, a huge number of what we would consider enlightened beings or saints, the equivalent of something like that with people with, with really advanced. Because we, we did an episode with Dean Radin, who works over at IONS, and, and I, I, maybe you know his experiment where he sealed a quantum device and had people imagine checking it. And That's that right. affected that quantum device, which is a mind-blowing thing. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, that there's almost, I couldn't help but thinking how this this moment at the Vatican was, is like a reversal of the Galilean moment. That's right? Right. I mean, everybody wants to tell the story about how the church, you know, says to Galileo, you know, forget it, I, we don't need to look. But th here they're gathering at this observatory, and they're saying something that a, a, a lot of scientists are still uncomfortable or skeptical about right. saying, I mean, I do think even in the scientific community, while they would grant that there's maybe life or whatever, they, they embrace the Fermi paradox and say, you know, where are they? They're not really here. Wouldn't they have made contact? And we can't understand that from, I think, the current perspective. I think there's another movie that's like that, and it's the one that had Jodie Foster in it. Contact. That's right. Contact is also a really great, it, it's a really great kind of description of the situation because it's it's it, it really relates to the consciousness of the person and arrival does too because it these aliens have to get somebody who's willing to change the way they think in That's order right. to properly interact and we That's don't right. understand that this is the deep socratic problem it's the problem that, of course jesus is pointing to buddha rumi the peacemaker here on on on, on turtle island they're yeah. all saying you don't understand how much you need to shift in order to understand the things you don't yet understand you sure. want to have it all be the same and you just get to have more weapons or more technology. And that's not the way it's going to work. Yeah. As, I, as Einstein said, you know, that that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness from which you've created the problem. Yeah. You know, so that this is a major elevation of human consciousness that we're facing here right now. And that, you know, the, in the, the old Sufi saying that when a, when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. You know, uh, and that's what we're experiencing right now. Right. Uh, that the military uh, industrial complex, they encounter the UFO phenomenon and they go, great, we can make a missile out of that. You know, right. or we can make a super jet fighter that can travel faster than the speed of light. You know, uh, and, you know, I mean, it, that that's a uh, Hal Putoff told me a story one time that Hal, Hal has been deeply involved in the Stanford Research Institute remote viewing. Yes. Yeah. Program. Absolutely. much more interested in the levels of consciousness and the role of human consciousness. And uh, he was he uh, was having a meeting with the science advisor for President Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were at a, a, a meeting together and the science advisor asked him to come outdoors so they could have a conversation, which tells you something uh, about the, the security they want to have over this. And he's outside and and, uh, and Hal said, you know, what, what's, uh, what do you think is the reason why we can't get the the people who know about this thing to share the information to do something more elevated about this and he said well, the guy said to him, uh, let me tell you a story he said uh, that will answer your question he said there's a story about an old man who was coming home from somewhere uh, late at night uh, and he's walking through this field and he sees a, a little light shining down in the grass in the field and he bends down uh, and he sees that it's a frog and the frog has this little light like on its head and he reaches down and picks up the frog and picks it up and it turns out that it's a crown uh, a little tiny crown on the head of the of the frog uh and the frog looks up at him and says oh please help me uh i'm not a frog i'm actually a princess that i've been turned into a frog by an evil sorcerer but if you will only kiss me uh i'll turn back into a princess uh and uh, we can become married and we can have many children, and you can have all of the uh, the riches of, of the world. Uh, and he looked at her, and he said, actually, at my age, he said, we can have children together. And he said, actually, at my age, I think I'll settle for just having a talking frog. <laughs> right. And puts it in his pocket and walks away. Yeah. That, that's what's happening right now uh, with our human family. Yeah. Uh, so that the, we at the New Paradigm Institute, uh, where people can reach us simply at newparadigminstitute.org, 
you know, and uh, we can provide them all the information about what's going on. Uh, we can hook them up with their own congressperson uh, and their senators. They can push a button because because what we've what we've experienced now is that Senator Schumer and Senator Rounds have already stated that they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop with getting only 24 pages of their bill uh, passed into law. Uh, that they, in fact, are going to come back and try to get an independent board put in charge of overseeing this disclosure process, including giving them subpoena power. Uh, and the ability to subpoena the people that are involved in this program, put them under oath, take depositions, sworn depositions from them, extract documents from them. Uh, and they have the authority to appeal to the attorney general of the United States to go to the federal district court and get a court order commanding them to turn over the information. And if they don't, put them in prison for contempt of court. Uh, and so that there's a, a whole set of provisions that were in the the other uh, 60 pages <laughs> that or the other 40 pages they got taken out of the senate bill so that they that they're not giving up on this thing mm. uh, nor are we at the new paradigm institute so we're, we're asking people to contact the new paradigm institute.org you know it'll tell them who their congress people are for a lot of people don't know because they've given up on the government they said oh look why, why should i bother trying to do get this government it's the most corrupt uh, congress they aren't doing anything they're all yeah. fighting with each other you know but the, the reality is in this one particular area we have a demonstration of the most profound uh bilateral support uh for this a completely nonpartisan, bipartisan support for this bill and it's just this tiny few people that are on the payroll basically of the aerospace industry that wants to make billions of dollars of profit on this as a weapon system yeah. that are stopping us. And Senator Schumer is indignant about this. Uh, and so are the other members of the Senate. And so are a lot of people in the in the House. Yeah. You know, so we're, we need to remobilize them to come back in uh, once the bill is, is signed into law on December 21st. The, as soon as they come back from the Christmas and, and weekend and holidays uh, of the new year, we're back on them, you know, yeah. just say, look at it. We're, we're insisting that the you, you put together an independent uh, panel to review this information on behalf of the president, you know, uh, and, uh, and also set up, as the bill requires, the Senate bill, setting up a controlled disclosure campaign plan uh, uh, of getting this out, rolling this information out to the American public and to the world so that we can be ushered into an entirely new era for our human family. Yeah. This is absolutely trans-historical, uh, yeah. what's Definitely. going on right now. Uh, so yeah. we've gotten the first step in. You know, We've gotten one step into the shallow end of the pool here You know, with the passage of this bill. And they've commanded them to turn it over. Uh, and they've very importantly uh, ordered that any of the information that's 25 years old or more needs to be revealed within 180 days by June 21st, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so unless the president stops them. And so that's we right. can focus on the president to say, don't stop this information right. coming out. You know, tell there's us. Another, there's another level there, isn't there too? Because so there's a part of me that thinks that, okay, if we really, really, that's it. You have some kind of event where the evidence becomes overwhelming. There's other life then maybe human beings will change. And then the question would be, you know, what are we going to do? But then it's almost like there's another direction that that maybe maybe this would all be not so debated and secretive if it weren't for the fact that perhaps so if you ask the if, if you if you embrace the Fermi paradox as well, why why isn't it obvious? Okay, if if all the people are out there, why why haven't we all seen them? And why isn't it just indisputable because we just we've seen the ships over the White House? Maybe part of what we need to do is not just put pressure on the politicians, but ask ourselves, why would they be so reticent and hesitant and hidden in their contact with this planet? So for instance, we've got a guy building rockets to leave this planet, to go to a planet where there is no life, right? So Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they all want to leave the planet and they're not doing anything to actually help the planet. Maybe as a species, we look quite ridiculous. We've got a, a war going on in Europe. We've got a war basically going on in the Middle East. There are horrors that are happening. And maybe part of what we need to do is, is to actually say show that we can take care 
of this world that we're a part of and get along with each other. And maybe that would actually increase disclosure from that extraterrestrial side. So, you know, I mean, it's one thing to put pressure on the president. It's another thing to almost to, to not think that's going to change us, that if we had that information, then it would change us. But maybe we also need to work on changing so that we do, do you yeah, see what I'm saying? Right. There's, there's no doubt about that at all. That, that, that uh, there, in, in the, when, when Lou, Lou Elizondo and I were sitting at a table with some of the people, the staff that are working on the, the bill and stuff, yeah, and then one of them said, you know, it's so frustrating. Why don't they come right out and reveal themselves? And, and I told him the story. I said, you know, there's a, a very well-known story of this young boy who loved butterflies. Uh, and he was collecting butterflies and he had this great big, huge, like aviary, like out in his backyard where they, they could fly all around in, in this big uh, web cage. Uh, and, but he was looking for the perfect specimen of a monarch butterfly. And he finally found uh, a, a cocoon of a, of a monarch butterfly and he brought it home uh, and he put it in a little box with cotton in it and put lights on it to keep it nice and warm. And he observed it and watched it. And over time, the, the cocoon started to, to develop into a full butterfly. And the butterfly started breaking out of the cocoon. And it broke out of the cocoon, and you could see its wings coming out, and it was struggling against the little sil uh, silken threads. And it got down to the very last moment where there was just one last silken thread holding it in the cocoon. And it was struggling and struggling and, and pushing its wings against the thread. And it couldn't get out. And the little boy took sympathy uh, took compassion upon it. And he went and got a little pair of scissors and he snipped the last little silken thread and the, the butterfly came free and it was absolutely perfect specimen of a monarch butterfly, except that it could never fly. Because as it turns out, it was struggling against that last silken thread that was necessary for it to exercise the muscles that enabled it to fly. Uh, and this is, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. We keep asking them, please come cut these these threads that we've woven around ourselves, you know, and free us from our own incapacities here. Yeah, but the reality is we have to be able to demonstrate. We have to struggle against these silken threads, these cords, these steel cords that we've bound ourselves in of war and famine and poverty uh, and, you know, allowing it one tenth of one percent of every generation to seize power and to maintain power over everyone else, that we have to be able to ra raise our own consciousness, you know, and the religious institutions are supposedly devoted to trying to do this, but they themselves have fallen prey to the same problem that, oh, we can't really cast out pearls among uh, uh, before the swine. We have to keep the secret in our monasteries and in our meditations and, and you know, and, and and the, the role of the Jesuit order, the largest single order in the largest denomination of all of Western civilization, you know, were created back in 1547 to reform the Catholic Church, to keep them from having to go through the Reformation. You know, that, 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 so that the reason that I am devoted to this is because I started working on this project in the Jesuit order as a candidate for the Jesuit priesthood. And what I've said is, look, that uh, we have to perform the services of reforming our, our religious institutions, our government institutions. We've got the we've got the concepts available for us. You know, there there is knowledge at the highest levels of all of the major religious denominations and the high mystics uh, of the capacities of our human family. You know that we have extraordinary capacities uh, if we will turn our attention to them. They're subtle. Uh, there is a faculty evolving in our human uh, our human family. Uh, it's like seeing or hearing that is evolving teleologically, that is able to directly and immediately experience the unitive phenomenon that bonds every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe into one unified harmonic whole. Uh, but it's a secret, uh, this faculty. You know, all we, we can see manifestations of it in ESP, you know, in, in telepathic communication. Uh, some people are able to levitate. You know that there, there. Some people can actually transmute uh, matter, uh, and, and, and there are capacities that our human family has that we see the occupants of the UFOs demonstrating to us. You mm -hmm. know, walking through walls and you know elevating uh, people off the ground and carry. You know, the, the 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 we are we are at an extraordinary moment here where it is time for our people to come alive. 
to rise to our highest expectations. And this is the mission of the religious orders. It's the, it's the mission of our constitution to enable people to remain free from the suppression of this tiny minority, uh, to exercise democratic uh, responsibility, to take control of our governmental institutions and our religious institutions. Uh, and that's what the New Paradigm Institute is about. Mm -hmm. We're here trying to create uh, with our others these conversations that have been called for uh, by by the by the Catholic Church as to call together uh, individual people from all walks of life and have these conversations about what the implications of this are. What are the, what are the impacts legally? What are the impacts politically? You know, how is this going to affect the geopolitical structures of our planet? You know, we have to start preparing for this experience. We don't want to be like the little tribe that was discovered back in the mid 1950s on a little island in the Pacific that, you know, when they discovered that there was this gigantic civilization all around them that they hadn't known about, their entire culture collapsed because they hadn't prepared for the the impact of the of the larger reality that they didn't know about, you yeah. know. This is what keeps being cited by the people that want to keep a secret. Oh, we can't tell everybody. You know, they'll all freak out and the economy will collapse and our government structures will collapse. What they really mean is that they will no longer remain in exclusive power. That's right. And the economic structures will exactly shift right. in ways that are not privileging a That's few. Exactly I mean, it's right. like there is this message that there is no alternative. If you present that there is an alternative and, and, it's, and it's so expansive. It's the expansiveness that I think is is kind of freaks us out a little. I did an interview, which I think I, I, I've i been sitting on it for a while, but I think I'll release it right after this one with Jeff Kripal. Did you, do you know oh, yes, Jeff I know, Kripal? Yeah. yeah. yeah yes. So sure. we were talking yeah, about this. He's got all those letters you were talking about that Whitley got. You know, they wrote, they're, all, they're all in the, the uh, Museum of the Impossible. Yeah. You know, just yeah. down at Rice University that Jeff is in charge of. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And we were talking about the super humanities, his, his recent book. And he, he, he has this lovely line, which is our superness pre pre precedes our humanity. We were super before we even had the ability to think of our separate ourselves off as human, that we were experiencing some of these higher level uh, capacities yeah. and they were just part of life. And they've been so marginalized because of how threatening they are. And you see this throughout all religious and philosophical and spiritual traditions. And that this is what our, our great teachers are offering us, Socrates and on and on. I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter where you go. Hildegard of Bingen, right? I mean, you see that she understands this world was made with medicine, but you have to have an attunement with the sacred, an attunement with the divine in order to be able to access it, or however you want to think of it, because I, you know, I, I'm not, I, I like actually the, the inclusiveness that um, is in Laudato Si and that I think is in this call to dialogue about this. It's really saying, hey, the Catholic Church is not claiming to have an exclusive, you know, truth about how this is is to be navigated. We need everybody. And he has a line in there about excluding no tradition, no source of wisdom and no source of scientific knowledge, but really bringing in inclusiveness, which again is shocking, right? The Catholic Church, but well, that's, it's really- That's exactly right. You know, what, what Francis is saying is that, you know, that we, the, the Catholic Church has to stop being committed to just trying to recruit new Catholics. You know, what they've got to do is share all the secrets that they have, you know, with everybody in the human family and work together with all the religious traditions and all the political institutions and cultural institutions to try to elevate our consciousness. Yeah. Because Francis knows what's happening. Yeah, you know, right. Uh, right. He's, he's got he's, he's got, got a lot of high level this, advisors. Right. Yeah, he's, tried, he's got to try to get this done before he dies. You right. know, and he's very sick now, you know, and, and the, the, there's pressure on him to try to retire and all that, but so that, that what we what we have to all do is respond uh, to to listen to the call to yeah. come forward uh, and to to elevate our own consciousness to try to understand that there are secrets right in front of us that have been put right in front of us as to how to do this. Right. You know, people know about meditation. People know about fasting. They know about particular kinds of exercises that you can engage in to elevate your consciousness. People have to understand that this is real. Uh, yeah. And that this is the pathway. This is the pathway to the stars, you know, is elevating our consciousness, establishing a, a set of diplomatic relations with the extraterrestrial uh, species that are here uh, and learning from the positive information that they have to share with us. At the same time, being smart and guided, you know, to, to not just sort of 
submit ourselves to them as if some big superior gods coming from the stars somewhere. You know, we have to try to understand what is of such fundamental and profound value of our yeah. own human family uh, so that we don't feel completely diminished, you yeah. know, by, by the fact that we're not at the apex of all sentient life in the universe. Yeah. You know, that this is something we have to come to grips with. We have to have a whole new worldview that yeah. integrates this new information that still maintains the value of each individual human being and yeah. the value of our species as a whole. That right. this, this is a task that we have to get about right now. Yeah, yeah, and we do it in part in relation to, because it, this is the microcosm of that, right? We don't value the, the worms, the soil, the yes. fungi, yes. if we don't understand their intelligence and that they have extraordinary intelligence just because it doesn't look like ours, doesn't mean it isn't. They have sentience, which we are That's so true. hesitant to recognize. And so, yeah, we have to be able to do that here. And it's like not valuing ourselves and not valuing our own family. That's and right. uh, yeah, and it's also interesting too, the Dalai Lama has had the same kind of attitude. He's adamant about not trying to recruit new Buddhists, but simply sharing the teachings, trying to have more dialogue and sharing things that had been restricted for centuries, restricted yes. teachings and saying, we'll That's publish right. them, you That's know, right. and encourage people to be careful. And so, I mean, there are dangers to doing that because there are reasons why some things are restricted because we're idiots and we go doing meditation practices we're not ready for. Yep. But at the same time, if we really do come together and help each other, there are these things that we might be able to access. It takes work and That's it right. takes cooperation and mutual support because a lot of us are, you know, suffering in ways that are, we're never quite this way or this widespread. You know, there have been traumatized individuals throughout all human history. Things have happened, but there is a level of anxiety, loneliness, depression, and trauma that seems to be kind of unprecedented. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot of actual work that we need to do, which is not always fun because fasting or meditating or having an actual spiritual life that seems to go somewhere. And it's not just, well, I feel like I'll meditate today. There's, right. there's, there's a discipline that's going to be required of us in that's order right. to make that paradigm shift that you're talking about. That's exactly right. And so, you know, there's activity we have to take with regard to getting enforcement provisions put back into this law. And now yeah. that it's passed, yeah. you know, we need to, uh, work with the religious institutions we need to work with the cultural legal institutions uh, that we have to work with uh, you know in the we have to bring the academy on board because you know that they they're places for gathering youth together in studying the different departments of knowledge that our human family has every one of which is going to be impacted uh, yeah. by this revelation uh, and so the, that's what we have to do so we, we also at the new paradigm institute are, are combining with a university uh, it's called Ubiquity University, it's, but it gives full full credits. You get, you know, undergraduate degrees. You can get a BA, which is fully accredited with all the other universities in the world, uh, a master's degree and a PhD degree in exo studies. We're going to be instituting this now. Uh, we're setting it up to be coming into operation right at the uh, at, at the end of the new year uh, or the beginning of the new year, and we're going to provide courses so people can get. Uh, to get a, a degree program uh, in this. Uh, and we're going to try to be to sharing this information with other universities, with Harvard, with Stanford, with MIT, Cornell, all the other major universities, state universities, you know, to get them to start setting up exo studies programs inside the each of the disciplines. Mm. It's hard work that has to get done, you know, and so that's why we're asking for people to support us. You know, the newparadigminstitute.org is real simple. You go there, and the first step that we want you to take is to push the button to establish contact with your congressional representatives and your senators to get them to put the enforcement provisions back into this law so that we have a, a there there, you know, yeah. where we have a place where this is actually being uh, uh, vetted and made available to the public. Because, you know, we only we have this time between December 21st and June 21st where we're getting ready to get this entire tranche of information <laughs> Yeah. is going to be coming out uh, that we have to try to get our institutions ready to process this you know yeah yeah wow okay this was this was really interesting stuff i really really thank you for for talking to us about this and we'll put links in the uh show notes and um i i, I hope i encourage people to to get in touch and if um, if you have any questions, uh, you can send them through dangerouswisdom.org or, or through the, the New Paradigm Institute. Get in touch and get active. We need participation 
in this world and in the cosmos at large somehow how do we arrive at that direct participation that intimacy with life you you you, you send us a copy of this and we'll put it up on our website too that we've got uh, like 120,000 people you know that uh, that we're sending information to regularly we're we're building a, a a very sophisticated communication system to be able to reach out into all 435 of the congressional districts uh to be able to share information back and forth with everybody uh, you know, so that the, we're we're doing that right now. We've been given a grant to set up. We have offices right in Washington D.C. on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're the only civilian group that actually is has offices inside the federal enclave. You know that we're right next door to the to the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee building. We meet with them regularly. We you know we're right next door physically to the United States Supreme Court across the street from the Capitol building. We're there where we're meeting with these staff regularly. Uh, and you can work with us on this. You, we can bring you into the heart of this discussion, you know, if you will just sign up with us and uh, it will help you. You know, we're not asking you all this. Not, it's free. You know, you just go go to new paradigm institute dot org and get all this information for free and, and become an activist. You know, uh, that's that's what we need to do. We, we need to be activists, not only in our public life, but in our private life to learn what some of the open secrets are about how we elevate our own consciousness here and how go. it relates to the philosophy and, and the political philosophy and everything else uh, of our world. Yeah, Just, it's, it's unifying that exciting. spiritual and political at the same time, you know, in a way that kind of resonates with what Thich Nhat Hanh did, right? He's saying you, you, that there is an engaged way of life that is not, it's not separate, it's not reclusive. And this is really focused on in such an interesting place that that draws our attention, that people are drawn by this issue. And then to find out, well, wait a minute, this links with questions of consciousness and questions of how I live a good life here in this world. That's what's really interesting. It's just a fascinating Very issue. Yeah. Very so thanks again, Danny. We appreciate your being here, my friend. Terrific, Nikos. It was really great. The opportunity to talk to everybody and get to meet you. Again. Yeah, again. Yeah. And thanks to all of you for joining us. If you have questions, if you have stories to share, maybe you've had your own experience. If you're an experiencer, let me know. We might be able to bring some of these uh, issues into future contemplations or interviews. And I've done other contemplations on this, looking forward to doing more interviews. So get in touch. In the meantime, this is Dr. Nikos, your friendly neighborhood soul doctor, reminding you that your soul and the soul of the world, indeed the soul of the cosmos, are not two things. So take good care of them.